Okay, it's eight o'clock, so I'll make a start. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name's Alex Mummery. I'm, um, I'm a trainee educational psychologist from the, uh, from the IOE in my second year of training. And uh, the presentation I'm gonna be sharing with you is, has been designed as a, an introduction to body dysmorphic disorder or uh, BDD as I'll refer to it from now on. And um, the training was uh, designed in collaboration between um, the BDD Foundation, OCD Action, and the National and Specialist BDD uh, CAM service at the Morsley Hospital. So I'd like to thank them first of all. Um, and just to say as well, this is something that's very personal to me also. I had my own experience with uh, BDD as a teenager. So it's something I'm very passionate about raising awareness of. Um, and so um, I'm happy to field any questions about my own experience as well. And you can add any questions to the, um, the Q&A box and they'll be read out anon anonymously. So no names will be used. Um, okay, so just to look at the objectives quickly for the session. We're gonna learn about the main characteristics of BDD. Uh, tackling some common misconceptions and distinguishing it from uh, similar and related disorders. We're going to look at how to recognize the key warning signs of BDD. And uh, we're also going to look at um, the current best supported evidence-based treatments, really. And the actual presentation should last just under 30 minutes, but then I can hang around for questions kind of for as long as we need. So just to start, I'm going to share an animation that has been um, commissioned by the BDD Foundation. Um, and it's just a great introduction to what the experience of someone, the experience of someone with BDD is like. It's just five minutes long. I really started thinking about my appearance when I started low six because I thought I'll make new friends. But that didn't really happen. Do I look good? Maybe I don't look good. Maybe that's why they didn't talk to me yesterday. Maybe they're not going to talk to me today because I have an infection. The more I saw that I wasn't really making friends in the months that went by, the more the thoughts intensified. And the more I thought, well, they definitely must not like me because I'm ugly. I'm ugly. Features of my face felt really distorted. It's almost like when you look at an object for too long or when you say a word too many times, it really feels wrong or looks wrong. And that's why my face felt like the more I looked in the mirror, the more I could find something wrong with it. I would just inspect my face. I would just spend minutes and minutes and minutes, 20, 30 minutes, looking at my face and obsessing over every single detail. Even if I had a scratch, to me it would be humongous, even though to my mom or my friends it would be like seeing a normal teenager, to me it would be like seeing a sort of an abnormality and something like an abomination in some way. I started putting more and more and more makeup on. The best description would be like a Ken doll because my face was really one color and it kind of looked like plastic. Even with all that makeup, even with all that reassurance from mom, I still remember feeling incredibly bad and incredibly ugly. It was just devastating. Throughout the school day, I would just ask for toilet breaks. I would just stare in the mirror and just reapply makeup or just try and style my hair in different ways. I would just look down and not look at anyone because I felt like if I just kept a low profile they wouldn't acknowledge me and they wouldn't acknowledge my face and my imperfections. Eventually I had to stop going to school. It was too many interactions, too many people. On the journey there, on the journey back, it was just too much for me. That wasn't enough. So I just had to start wearing a hat and a scarf or a balaclava on some days so that my face would be completely covered, only my eyes would be visible. I really loathed the way I looked. Even briefly looking at myself became too much and so mum had to unmount the mirror from the wall. I even got to the point where I wouldn't let mum or dad look at me. I would eat on my own, I would just avoid any contact with people. On some days, I just couldn't get out of bed the whole day. 
I just felt really powerless to change the way I looked. I just felt so ugly, so disgusting, that the only way to stop feeling like that was just to stop feeling anything at all. That really put a lot of stress on mum and dad. They didn't know how to help, they didn't know what to do. I didn't really know about BDD myself, but mum was the one that really helped me realise what it was. I remember going to one of the therapy groups and we were talking about, you know, being brave and taking the leap and doing things that were scary. I felt, okay, I, I need to do something. And I took off my scarf and hat and I let people see me. And it was really the first step in my treatment in getting better in the treatment. I did exposures, they're tasks in which you get pushed to the limit of your comfort. We'd go out in London, take the tube, go to the park, where I'd let people interact with me, I'd look at people in the eye. The more I did this, the more I felt I could do more. It was kind of a snowball effect and that really kept the process of getting better going. Now, life is very different. Even if I've noticed something on my face, I can still go out, enjoy my day, have fun with friends and interact with people. You have to really compartmentalize your illness and separate it from yourself. It's not who you are, the illness. It's just something that's trying to take over you, but you know, you can fight it. Okay, so I think that's just a great introduction to what life is might be like for someone with BDD. Um, you know, how serious it can be but also how positive outcomes can be with, with the right treatment and help. So I'm just gonna switch back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so just to start by looking at what is BDD, just so we have a clear picture of that. Um, and these are the four diagnostic criteria that you'd find in the DSM-5 or the ICD-11. So firstly, BDD is now considered to be a form of OCD, um, which is quite a recent addition that wasn't in the DSM-4, I believe. And, and this is because it involves um, an obsession or a preoccupation with a perceived flaw or flaws in one's physical appearance, um, which the sufferer will be preoccupied with for at least one whole hour each day. And uh, the focus can be any body part, but some of the most common are the skin, the nose, the hair or the teeth. Um, so it's usually a sort of facial feature most commonly, but not always. Um, secondly, Someone with BDD will spend large amounts of time engaged in repetitive behaviours related to their obsession. So trying to fix or hide their flaws, in inverted commas, um, repeatedly checking in mirrors, spending hours applying makeup like the boy in the animation, or engaging in other lengthy grooming rituals. Thirdly, for a diagnosis of BDD, the worry cannot be exclusively about being too large or too overweight as this would more likely result in a diagnosis of an eating disorder. And that might seem like a somewhat pointless differentiation and eating disorders are certainly closely related to BDD, uh, but they are kept separate, I think partly because the treatment options that have been found to be effective for, for each are quite different. Um, and so I suppose the name body dysmorphic disorder is perhaps quite misleading somewhat and maybe results in some of the misconceptions about it. Um, might be more accurate to call it body part dysmorphia or something like that. Um, and finally, as with any mental health disorder, for it to be considered a disorder, the obsession about appearance must cause you know, clinical levels of anxiety and and or an impairment in uh, social or educational functioning or occupational functioning. So just to focus in on some of those diagnostic criteria and talk about how serious BDD can be, which I think we got a sense of from the animation. Um, and also how it's, you know, it's not simply a more serious form, really, of normal appearance concern. Um, it is considered to be a form of OCD, and it's markedly different in some key ways. And, you know, a big reason for creating this training was to tackle misconceptions about BDD. One being that it's just normal to worry about your appearance like this, um, especially as a teenager. And this misconception can lead to significant delays in identification and uh, treatment for someone with BDD. And while it is certainly true that it is normal to worry about your appearance, um, with BDD, the concern is kind of much more extreme in three key ways. So firstly, uh, the amount of time that it takes up. Um, people with BDD will worry about their appearance for a lot longer than other people. The diagnostic criteria specifies an hour, but this can seem quite arbitrary because someone with BDD most likely spends, you know, almost every waking minute preoccupied with their obsession in some way. 
Um, if they're not engaging in the repetitive behaviors like mirror gazing or grooming, they'll probably be comparing themselves to others in their head or otherwise just ruminating on their own appearance. Uh, so it's important to stress how time consuming it is. Uh, secondly, the, the level of distress that it causes. Um, people with BDD often experience very high levels of anxiety and often depression because of their obsession. And um, anyone with a sort of your typical image concern, appearance concern, they're unlikely to have the same intense emotional response to their dissatisfaction with their appearance. And if they do, it's more likely to be more short lived. And thirdly, the level of impairment that BDD can cause. People with BDD often experience life as a constant struggle. Again, we saw in the animation, the young boy was kind of bedridden for, for periods of time. And they might be unable to leave the house to speak to people, maintain friendships um, or take part in many activities that they would love to do, but they they can't because they feel deformed or um, abnormal. And it's just this fear of exposure, really, in public. And uh, and those with normal appearance concerns don't find that they're prevented from doing things that they want to because of their appearance. And there's one final uh, sort of key aspect, main characteristic of BDD that I'd like to highlight and uh, it's that of insight or a lack of insight more specifically. And um, insight doesn't affect whether a diagnosis of BDD is given or not, but the, uh, the ICD-11 specifies BDD with poor or absent insight and BDD with fair to good insight. Um, and so it's a very common problem with BDD, if not a universal factor to some extent for people with BDD. It was previously referred to as delusionality um, which I think gives you a, a quite a clear idea of what a lack of insight means. Uh, but this was eventually considered insensitive terminology. But what it means is people with BDD tend not to realise that they have BDD. And that's especially tr true during adolescence. And uh, instead, they tend to think that they're quite literally physically abnormal um, or, you know, repulsive to other people. And this can make... BDD very difficult to talk about um, if you if, for people with BDD um, because if you were to think that your problem was entirely physical you wouldn't really imagine that anyone could help you as, aside from maybe a cosmetic surgeon and um, you'd probably really rather not draw people's attention um, to your appearance if you thought it was pointless to do so you know um, so this maybe in part explains why BDD is relatively unknown compared to other disorders, um, you know, even in professional circles, even amongst mental health professionals, it would seem. So just to look at some statistics about BDD, it affects, estimated to affect about one in 50 adolescents in the UK, so 2%, um, which means it is as prevalent as other conditions like eating disorders and OCD. And it's actually more prevalent than anorexia if we take that in isolation. Um, however, it, it seems that the disorder is still quite severely underdiagnosed, um, perhaps partly because although there are telltale signs to look out for, um, BDD doesn't really have any obvious outward symptoms and it's essentially in, invisible. Whereas I think, you know, people recognize the concerning physical change that might result for someone suffering with anorexia. There's not really an equivalent for BDD. And as a result, it can take an average of um, 15 years for sufferers of BDD to get the right diagnosis and treatment. Um, it affects boys and girls roughly equally, um, unlike anorexia, which is predominantly uh, um, females. And um, it tends to emerge during adolescence, uh, most commonly between the ages of 12 and 16. You might see some signs before that, but to qualify for a diagnosis, 12 is probably about the youngest. And in terms of comorbidities, um, these four here occur in at least 30% of um, people with BDD. So we have major depression occurs in 75%, um, a substance abuse disorder in 49%, um, social phobia in 30, and then OCD in 30 as well, kind of the the typical form of OCD that we tend to think of when we're talking about OCD. So you can really see that crossover with, with OCD there. And suicidal ideation 
unfortunately occurs in 80% and suicide attempts in 24 to 28. Um, so that's a, that's a very common thing as well. And obviously not uncommonly, that tragically leads to suicide completion. And so just to look at some of the causes of BDD, um, which I think it's important to look at, I think these are often misunderstood as well. So twin studies have compared the rates of co-occurrence of BDD um, between identical and non-identical twins. Um, the thinking being that if BDD has a somewhat genetic basis, um, identical twins should show a higher rate of co-occurrence of BDD than non-identical twins. And that is indeed um, what has often been found. And so these studies estimate um, a heritability rate of between 42 to 49%. So it seems there is a somewhat genetic component. And in terms of how this, this might manifest sort of in the brain, um, neurological studies have found heightened activity in the ventral visual system. This is one sort of brain difference that has been found. Um, and this is the area that is responsible for the processing of visual detail. And this seems to create an over-focusing on, on detail and as such impairs holistic processing. So people with BDD may literally see themselves differently um, to how other people see them. They process their facial features one at a time um, rather than seeing their whole face at once. And as such, it's maybe something of a distortion of what others see, which was very nicely illustrated by the animation when his face is literally distorting. And it's maybe less stable as an image as well. Um, and that's something that people with BDD often describe when they're focusing on the kind of the, the body part that they might be obsessed with. They describe it growing or maybe pulsating. So this is almost something that they experience quite literally. Um, and just as an interesting aside, um, one study found that this uh, detail focus seemed to result in a significantly superior ability to recognize faces in different configurations, such as when presented upside down, because uh, people with BDD are sort of processing the features one at a time. And so they were able to recognize those same features in different um, configurations. And also 25% of people with BDD also have a career or education in the arts. Um, which I found per very personally interesting. My original degree was in, was in fine art before I switched to psychology. Uh, so this detail focus maybe seems to result in an aesthetic sensitivity of sorts, you could say. Uh, but of course, as always, envir environmental factors also play a, a large part in the development of BDD and appear to account for roughly the other 50% of variation. So it seems to be somewhat even split. And uh, the environmental factors most commonly cited by people with BDD are appearance-based bullying, unsurprisingly, um, emotional abuse at home, and sort of societal expectations of beauty or images of beauty, which I suppose are currently the most, most widely disseminated by social media, things like Instagram. Um, but, you know, not exclusively, and I think societal expectations of beauty have kind of always existed. Um, and I think sometimes social media kind of gets the sole blame for these things, but I think it can exacerbate things, but um, maybe, you know, giving it complete blame for things like BDD is, is maybe going too far. Um, but it doesn't seem that these environmental, environmental factors always need to be particularly severe or to occur for extended periods to act as triggers of BDD. So it would seem that maybe for some, the underlying genetic neurological factors create a susceptibility to these environmental triggers. However, many individuals with BDD do describe having experienced more significant and long-term environmental triggers. So it seems perhaps these genetic environmental factors combine to different degrees in different individuals, probably like, you know, with most, with most things. And uh, just to clear up another common misconception, um, there often seems to be a bit of confusion between BDD and eating disorders um, and between BDD and gender dysphoria. So BDD is different from an eating disorder in that the, uh, the main concern there with an eating disorder is to do with weight or gaining weight. And uh, the unhealthy behaviors that you might see in response to this sort of concern might include restricting food, counting calories or purging after eating, all with a specific aim to lose or control weight. And 
with BDD, the concern is not necessarily or exclusively about weight or body shape, although, of course, that can be involved as well. There's always crossovers. And um, but BDD is usually about a part of the body and the unhealthy behaviors you, you see, they might include controlling weight or diet. But this is more likely to be because someone with BDD believes that restricting their diet will improve the appearance of, say, their skin or their hair. And um, BDD is also very different to gender dysphoria in that the focus there, of course, is on gender identity. And someone with BDD, they might be concerned with their gender signifiers, so their breasts or their genitals, but um, it has nothing to do with their gender assignment. It's to do with the outward appearance of those body parts. And so although cosmetic surgery um, is certainly common with BDD, it's not, it's not about wanting the body part to be removed or regendered. And so just to clarify, BDD is focused on a specific part or parts of the body, not the body as a whole, um, perhaps because of that detail focus that um, we've mentioned. And the repetitive behaviors are attempts to fix or hide those flaws. And so just to look at some of those, some of those behaviors really, that might act as warning signs that someone might be dealing with BDD. Um, you know, maybe in school or, or otherwise, just, you know, in young people in general, but the most common behavior that you would see is going to be sort of checking behaviors. They're referred to as checking behaviors. Um, and this most often involves looking into mirrors for long amounts of time or very regularly looking into reflective surfaces, taking, uh, you know, lots of pictures or videos of, um, of oneself, um, probably from lots of different angles often, because, you know, these checking behaviors, it's kind of, I think the young person is trying to figure out what they look like. They want to get an objective sense of what they look like to other people, because that's quite hard, I suppose, for anyone to, um, to, to understand. But for someone with BDD, it's hard for them to really get a clear picture of what they look like to other people. And so a young person, you know, they might leave class regularly to go and check in the bathrooms, like the young boy in the animation. That's something I used to do as a teenager. My teachers probably wondered what I was up to, but um, I never would have told them. Um, and another quite common form of checking is just a young person touching the body part in question. Um, so if they were obsessed with, say, their nose, they might very obsessively feel the shape of their nose, just to sort of check what does this look like to other people? What shape is my nose? Um, secondly, disguising behaviors are very common. And again, we saw those in the animation. Um, the boy started by wearing heavy makeup and he kind of progressed to wrapping his face in a scarf. So excessive grooming, yeah, the heavy makeup, wearing hair over the face perhaps. And a young person might avoid um, regulation school uniform as well um, for, this, for this reason to sort of um, yeah, help with their disguising behaviors. Number three might be body alterations. So seeking or getting body alterations, this could involve very excessive exercise. Um, and this would be, you know, talking about going to the gym for many hours to the point that it starts to harm the body, which doesn't prevent um, a young person, you know, continuing very obsessively to exercise um, or work out in the gym. And also very common is seeking or getting cosmetic surgery because, you know, people with BDD are often, you know, very keen to change their appearance, to change the thing they're obsessed with, because they think once I change it, once it's, you know, um, once I'm happy with that body part, then this will all go away, which of course, unfortunately it doesn't. Um, and I suppose the equivalent behavior with something like anorexia is, is the, the controlling of the diet. And um, that behavior, it, it does sort of start to change the body. Um, and so the equivalent with BDD, if someone's obsessed with their nose, the only way to change that is through cosmetic surgery. So it's kind of the equivalent, I suppose. But, um, but yeah, it's kind of, um, it's not something that does help BDD, but it is very common. Uh, number four might be a young person voicing their concern, but um, probably quite indirectly, they're probably not going to say, help me, I'm, I'm obsessed with, the, with, my, um, with my nose, keep using nose as an example but um so they might be more, more indirect about it maybe saying do you think i'm ugly or um or maybe comparing themselves to others as well very regularly saying oh they're so much prettier than i am they're so much more handsome than i am um you know and to a quite obsessive degree again 
um, saying these things very regularly. Number five, you might see a decline in academic performance, um, which may be a result of just the difficulty that young people with BDD can have uh, just with focusing their attention. And again, that's something I experienced. My teachers probably thought I just had attentional difficulties, but really my mind was just on something else. Um, and that can make it very difficult to focus. Number six is also poor school attendance. Um, it's very common for people with BDD to inconsistently attend school and complete school refusal is not uncommon. And I think this connects to number seven, which is avoiding social contact, because I think at its worst, BD, you know, people with BDD, they just don't want to be seen in public. They don't want to be around other people. They, they, they tend to think everyone is looking at them, judging them negatively uh, based on their appearance. And it's just this intense uh, self-consciousness that um, leads to, you know, just avoiding other people in general. Number eight, just symptoms of anxiety, because that's such a, you know, part and parcel of BDD but maybe particularly around exposure of a part of the body that you might not expect. So if a young person kind of has their hair over their face all the time and their hair comes away from their face and that clearly causes them intense anxiety, that might be a sign because that's not, that's not something that would usually cause a young person anxiety really. And um, young people with BDD, they might also avoid PE because of that fear of exposure, anything that involves maybe getting changed out of their, you know, the clothes that they've chosen to wear. Um, number nine, you might see symptoms of depression because of that very high comorbidity. Um, obviously, that's not an uncommon thing at all. It's not exclusive to BDD. Um, but maybe in conjunction with some of these other behaviours, um, that might act as a warning sign. And finally, number 10 is just, you know, self-injurious behaviour because we've seen that suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts are very common. Self-harm is, is not uncommon as well for people with BDD. And one quite specific self-injurious behaviour is, is skin picking, um, because skin is actually by far the most common site of obsession for young people with BDD. And this can lead to them, people with that particular obsession, quite very obsessively picking at their skin in an attempt to kind of smooth it out, which of course, unfortunately, has the opposite effect. But because of the kind of obsessive compulsive nature of these behaviours, they will continue to pick and start to create quite serious open sores on the face. Um, and so that's quite a, a common and quite specific form of sort of self-injurious behavior that you might see. And uh, just, this is the final slide. It's just to look at the kind of um, accepted forms of treatment, currently most evidence-based treatments for, for BDD. Um, so first of all, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, is, um, is the most accepted treatment, um, quite a specific form um, because it, in, it, it always includes um, exposure and response prevention or ERP for short. And uh, ERP evol involves uh, perhaps incrementally exposing the site of fixation um, or incrementally exposing oneself to engaging in repetitive behaviors less often. Again, we saw the young boy in the animation, he was engaging in some exposures and I think his were just going out in public because he was so afraid of kind of, um, yeah, being seen in public. So his exposure was getting on the tube, just kind of letting himself be seen. And so these exposures are obviously developed with a therapist. Um, they're very specific to each person. Um, but for example, they might involve wearing less makeup each time you leave the house until eventually you're wearing none at all, or maybe reducing the amount of time taking up looking in the mirror until you, you don't look at all or you look at a normal amount. Um, but it's just important that these exposures happen in, in small steps to keep anxiety at a manageable level. And therapy usually happens alongside a course of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs which are the medications used in the treatment of um, OCD and depression as well. And the research on these treatments sort of in conjunction um, is very encouraging and shows uniformly statistically significant improvements in symptoms across studies compared to controls. And so they're usually used in combination. Uh, being aware of, you know, there might be a, some, something of a publication bias in studies, but this is quite a consistent, fi um, consistent finding. And there are many stories of complete recoveries 
um, following this treatment that you can find on websites like the BDD Foundation. And I like to think of myself as one example of that as well. I think we saw in the animation, the young boy seemed to um, completely recover from his BDD as well. So I think we can be really hopeful about um, outcomes for young people with BDD. Um, and so, okay, yeah, so these are some contact details of the um, organizations that designed this training. We have the BDD Foundation, OCD Action, and um, the National and Specialist BDD Service for Young People, which is a CAM service. And they've um, kind of asked me to emphasize that they're very open to being contacted with questions and inquiries. Uh, and they're a great group of professionals that I've come to know um, through this project and some other ones as well. Um, and so just to summarize at the end, so BDD is a, a common and debilitating form of OCD that causes quite intense anxiety and dysfunction. It's difficult to understand that you have BDD because of that common lack of insight. It's not just kind of a typical teen teenage image concern. Um, it is markedly more severe and quite different in those key ways that we looked at. It can negatively impact on young people's well-being and education in many different ways. Uh, it's hard to spot, but there are a number of telltale signs to look out for. And just to emphasize that, you know, just to be hopeful and that, um, you know, outcomes can be really strong for young people with BDD once they start uh, getting the right, the right treatment. Um, so that was just kind of a, a very quick introduction to BDD, um, just kind of the key characteristics. Um, I hope it was useful. So thank you all for listening. Um, and now it's time for questions, which I think are in the Q&A box. Um, Okay, just stop screen sharing. Okay. So we've got, I want to ask whether an EP worked with you when you were in school to help with your BDD. If not, what would you have wanted an EP to have done to help you? Yeah, that's a very good question. I didn't actually have um, an EP working with me when I was at school. I didn't, um, I didn't let anyone know that I was um, dealing with this. I kept it very much to myself and I kind of always did. And I didn't deal with it until I was about 25. I would have considered myself quite a, a more low level sort of case, um, not as severe as the boy in the animation. I was able to attend school. I did sometimes find it difficult to focus, but I was very much able to keep, um, keep it hidden. And so no one really knew. I think um, once I did start dealing with it, at the age of about 25, it did kind of start to um, unravel quite quickly. Um, I, I, I had CBT on the NHS actually. And um, once that process started, the, you know, the thought processes started to unpick themselves quite quickly. And so um, I imagine if an EP had come along when I was a bit younger, um, you know, maybe at the age of 15, it could have been 10 years earlier. I think it could have been dealt with um, a lot sooner. And um, so, and what, in terms of what an EP might have done, I think it would have gone a long way just to tell me about BDD. I had no idea that this is a thing that existed because a lot of people don't. And, um, and really, when I first heard about BDD, that kind of kickstarted the process of getting over it. Um, because I sort of went away and did my own research into it, um, gained a better understanding, and I started to get that insight that was kind of lacking before, a sense of, oh, this might be a problem that's psychological rather than physical. Um, and once I started to get that insight, um, it kind of snowballed. Um, and so I think a bit of psychoeducation, I suppose, um, could have gone a long, a long way. Um, and I suppose also there, there might be space for EPs to, um, to do more, some th direct therapeutic work. Um, a lot of EPs are CBT trained. Um, and as a sort of more low level case, I think an EP would have been more than qualified to, to sort of undertake that kind of work with me. I think some cases of BDD, it would be more, much more um, significant young people that are in danger of suicide and maybe any that maybe that is a um, beyond an EP's you know 
competency generally. Um, but for low level cases, I, I think uh, therapeutic work could be possible as well. And, um, and I think, of course, also a preventative work would go a long way, maybe on a more systemic level. I think um, addressing, um, well, if we look at those kind of those key um, environmental triggers, so kind of appearance based bullying, I think a big one is the, the sense of um, the societal expectation of beauty um, or, of you know, appearance standards. I think um, young people very much have this sense that the way they look is incredibly, incredibly important for their success, you know, romantically, uh, occupational success. Um, and so I think preventative work that starts to, that tries to, you know, unpick those kind of preconceptions that young people might be given by our culture. I think that would go a long way as well to dealing with some of these, um, some of these issues. Um, okay, I've got another question, I've got another couple of questions. I wondered whether individuals who experience permanent changes or injuries to their body as a result of a trauma such as a car crash, burns, etc., are more likely to experience BDD? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I, don't, I haven't seen any sort of research into that or anything. Um, well, I would say BDD doesn't tend to actually be particularly connected to how someone looks you know it doesn't it doesn't impact on people who look a certain way um i suppose someone who's experienced a permanent change to their body that's going to be a change to their body uh it's going to be a very traumatic thing for sure i'm not sure if it would make them more likely to experience bdd um i can't really say it's an interesting question i think it would maybe possibly cause a, a different kind of, of a different kind of trauma because it's a change to the body and people with BDD it's kind of the body they've kind of or the the appearance they've been born with that's causing them this anxiety um, and I think a, a, a serious change to the body due to an injury um, it's possible that it could lead to BDD I can't really say but I think it would cause maybe a different kind of trauma that maybe would be dealt with in a different way and maybe um, I suppose treatment for that might have to be something more sort of coming to terms with what's happened to you. Um, yeah, and maybe CBT could be good for that. I'm not sure, but yeah, that's an interesting question. Thank you for that one. Um, I think I've got one more question here. Um, so someone like, someone says that their, their son makes his stomach bigger by padding out his shirt or jumper and since the end of March, this has become 10 times worse and he looks completely out of proportion. OK, we pay a therapist to talk to him once a week by phone, but this doesn't seem to have much effect. The more I hear about BDD, the more I think you need specialist help. As parents, we feel helpless. You said it can take up to 15 years to get the right diagnosis and treatment. Is there anything you can recommend? We live in Edinburgh. Well, I think you can definitely speak to um, the, the people at the Maudsley Hospital and their contact details are um, at the end of the slides and hopefully they um, they have already been shared. If not, I can find a way to circulate their, their email address because they are very open to being contacted with inquiries. And I think they would be very good at directing you to maybe an equivalent service near Edinburgh, or maybe just giving you some, some advice for, what, um, so for how you can help your son. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, because, the the uh, the clinical psychologists at the Maudsley are very keen to emphasise that they are very open to being contacted and they are experts in this um, in this field in the terms of in terms of the treatment they deal exclusively with BDD and so they are very much the ones to speak to and um, so I would recommend giving them an email or a call perhaps um, okay I think that's all the questions that have come through I hope I haven't missed any um, okay in the chat I think. Some of those links have been, oh, there's a lot, a lot of links been shared actually. So I think, yes, the contact details are, are there at the very top for the National Specialist Center for OCD and BDD. Um, yeah, I'd really recommend giving them a, a call. Oh, and there's their phone number as well. Great. Um, okay, so I think that's, um, 
all the questions answered. Um, I'm very open to being um, emailed afterwards. If anyone has any other questions, I can quickly put my email address down here. I hope that's okay to do. I don't mind. Um, I'll put my work email address. So if anyone has any extra questions um, that come to their mind later on, uh, please feel free to email me. Um, great, yeah. And if there's no more questions for now, thank you all very much for listening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been been useful. And oh, and there's a link to the, the webinar is now uh, viewable on YouTube as well.